Welcome back. So now we're going to start talking about Ludwig Lachmann and some of his contributions to Austrian economics. Now, we're going to talk about specifically in this video his market process theory. Okay? And this is how you spell Lachmann in case you're taking notes. Lachmann is quite different from both Kirchner and Schumpeter. And the main difference is the following. This supply and demand curve, whereas Schumpeter and Kirchner always assume that the market converges towards equilibrium. Lachman says, no, markets are in a continual state of disequilibrium. Try to draw this here to show like kind of motion, right? This equilibrium state never really happens. In fact, it's probably just bouncing all around. I kind of laugh. It's, it's like a Newtonian physicist would tend to say that there's a perfect state of harmony or equilibrium within an atom, whereas a quantum physicist would say, no, you can only guess the approximate location of an electron at any given time. Same thing with Lachmann's market process theory. So markets actually are in a continual state of disequilibrium. We're going to talk a little bit more about why that is. First, Lachmann says, yes, entrepreneurs do create opportunities ex nihilo. Yes. They do create something out of nothing, and every time this happens, every time they create a new opportunity, man, guess what's happening? This thing that's already got like a little bit of statistical noise, a little bit of vibration, not moving around. Well, you know what? New opportunity comes around, bam, brand new supply and demand curve. There's your new state of equilibrium. Now you're going to try to keep up with it, and by the time you even get close, bam, we're just going to slash that puppy out, and you know what? There's going to be another new equilibrium thing coming along, all because of the fact that entrepreneurs continuously, through the process of innovation, create new ideas, they create new things. Ergo, because of X and the Hello creation, the market is in a continuous state of disequilibrium. Main difference. Okay? The second thing builds on theories of effectuation and enactment. Okay? And this explains how it is possible to create opportunities ex nihilo. I'm going to go ahead and erase this because I'm going to start bouncing off the wall because I think this is so important. Okay? Let's try to draw this stuff in, in advance because I didn't want to have the squeaky marker, but you know, I'm shooting from the hip. All right, here we go. How does effectuation and enactment work? Okay? Under a Schumpeterian or a Kirchnerian understanding of economics, the world functions on Porterian rents. Okay? See this circle here? Imagine that that is the amount of wealth in the world. Okay? So you've got the firm with the black marker. They've got this amount of pie, this amount of the world economy. Okay? And you've got this other firm, the green firm, they've got this amount of the world economy. So if the firm that's the black marker wishes to take, wishes to grow in this particular example, by definition, they must take from the firm of the green marker. Okay? Because the amount of wealth in the world, it's like a piece of pie. It's fixed. It doesn't grow. Okay? You think about that supply and demand curve. That equilibrium between supply and demand is right here. Okay? This circle is the amount of wealth. It's the same thing as the intersection of a supply and demand curve. And so therefore, okay, just like Schumpeter, you've got to engage in either something like creative destruction. In other words, you start messing with the currently existing equilibrium, and therefore you take somebody else's wealth, or you'd be the scenario entrepreneur and you're so smart and maybe you perceive that this other stuff hasn't been taken yet, and so you take this. Either way, rent is seen as what we call zero sum. In other words, in order to grow, you've got to take away from somebody else. It's an either or kind of game, okay? Now, compare that to two of Lachman's understand ideas, effectuation, which also comes from Sarah Spathy. It's not really Lachman's, but this effectuation is an explanation of it, or enactment, okay? Effectuation looks and says, you know what? 
Competitive advantage of a firm or entrepreneurial opportunities do not come from the external environment, i.e. from that externally existing supply and demand curve, but rather they come from within inside the firm. It's what's inside the firm that counts. Okay? So it's by recombining resources in new and different ways. Okay? Let me give an example. I'll give two examples actually. Okay? Think of Apple. Apple is a great example. Okay. So, as a kid growing up in the 90s, Apple was kind of the weird computer company, right? You know, who used Apple computers while well, like elementary schools used them and like maybe some gamers and people that just wanted to be weird. It wasn't for anything serious, right? For the serious market was all the Windows and all the PC and the, uh, the PC uh, Windows compatible computers that were out there in the 90s, right? So, we're going to imagine that Apple is the green amount of wealth and you look at the total computer market and the um, 1990s at that time. So Microsoft would be like the black pen. So for Apple, this itty bitty little sliver of the total market to grow, Apple is going to have to try to compete head on with Microsoft or try to snuff out all of these other computer companies that were making knockoff PCs. Right? Apple doesn't really conceivably have much of a chance in this case. So what does Apple do? This is effectuation in action. They start looking with inside the firm. Apple had some unique capabilities that they were developing. They were developing like this music platform where you could download music and they were starting to develop the ability to miniaturize their computers, right? So what did they do? They start getting into a brand new market of portable digital music, right? Well, Microsoft, guess what, the, the black pen, they're not really doing any of that. But it's okay, because see, now Apple has entered this brand new market. And they entered this market by focusing on their core capabilities. They knew a little bit about music, this musical platform. Again, it kind of catered to the weird market, right? And then they catered to kind of this cool, weird, quirky reputation. And then they combined that with this ability to miniaturize computing power. And that's how the iPod was born. And they entered this new market, okay? Then they, they continue to focus on this music thing, and they continue to focus on miniaturizing their computing power, and they build on something that's going on in the environment at that time, and that is namely the fact that internet was taking off. Like internet started to become more available with Wi-Fi and cellular internet and all these other things. And then what does Mac do? They enter the smartphone market. And they entered the smartphone market because they turned this thing that used to be the iPod into an iPhone, which was a telephone, was a computer, and I could even draw another circle to illustrate the end of the telephone market. It was a telephone, it was a computer, it played music, it surfed the internet, it did all sorts of crazy cool stuff, right? So see how much Apple has grown? Well, Microsoft remained more or less in this original market, and Apple is now much a uh, much larger company than it was, it doesn't matter that their computer market probably hasn't grown that much, although in reality we know that it, you know, it has. But that's not the point of this illustration. Don't you hate when you like take a green pen and you draw a black pen and it messes it up, like what just happened there, okay? So, this is effectuation in action. It's by combining the resources that you currently control to capture new markets, okay? I'll give another example. Um, got a, uh, got a, I've had a couple of students, and they're going to remain nameless. And um, their father runs a logistics business. Okay? Now, logistics is a really, really tough market to get into, right? Because you've got to have trucks and supply warehouses and, and, and. So the biggest players in the logistics market are these big black pen people, right? Not the little itty bitty green ones, because the itty bitty green ones, you know, have trouble spreading their costs. But so what they did is they found a way to spread their costs in a new and unique way. One of the biggest problems that you got in logistics, especially with trucking, is the fact that those trucks sit. You know, maybe the trucks are on the road for eight, 12, 16 hours a day even, but you know, for the most part, drivers get tired, they get sleepy, and so there's off periods during the day, right? So what they did is this student of mine took her father's business of trucking and said, hey, what if 
we start doing on-demand delivery services. They create a, it's kind of like, an, it's like Uber Freight, for lack of better comparison. And they got into an on-demand logistics market by combining a knowledge of app development with a capability in logistics. So their job has, their market has grown tremendously in this on-demand thing, while the other firms in traditional logistics are still doing the telephone, the email, paper orders. But this is great. People say, hey, I need this delivered to this point. They punch it in the app. Bam. My former student, they're picking your stuff up and they're delivering it. You're not waiting on the other guys. That's another example. So they enter a new market. This is effectuation. And this is a way that opportunities can be created ex nihilo. Another way is through enactment. The best way that I can describe enactment is Bobby's World. Right? I don't know if anybody watched that awesome cartoon from the early 90s, Bobby's World. But in Bobby's world, Bobby would imagine something like some sort of a wild, crazy fantasy, and then somehow it would kind of sort of come into reality. Okay? Enactment is the same thing, right? An entrepreneur can dream or visualize something that they would like to do, and by dreaming and visualizing it enough, even though it's far out there in the realm of the abstract, it sort of kind of ingresses into reality. It sort of kind of becomes part of their, their reality. Let me give an example. Think of, for a second, the idea that uh, one of my students was saying, you know what I'm going to do? I've got one hobby. I like to spend money. I like to go to TJ Maxx, and I like maxing out my credit card. Wouldn't it be cool if I started buying things at TJ Maxx and then selling them on eBay and making uh, millions of dollars? I said, you know what? That's a wild and crazy idea. You should try it. And you know what happened? Did she make millions and millions of dollars? No. Is she making a fair amount of money on the side? Yes because she had a wild and crazy dream and 5% of that wild and crazy dream came into reality, okay? Let's say, for example, you've got a crazy professor who's on a YouTube channel thinking about, well, you know what? I'm gonna be a millionaire on YouTube and millions of people are gonna viral click my videos talking about Ludwig Lachmann's Austrian economics. Has that happened yet? No, unless you subscribe, give me a thumbs up, comment, tell your friends about it, that is. But for the moment, no. But do I create these videos and maybe possibly someday I get to a point where I can make enough money off of my YouTube videos to, I don't know, go to a movie once a month? Maybe. That's like a fraction of what the dream was, but at least was an impetus towards creation. Hopefully that example helps. All right. Next part of Ludwig Lachmann's uh, understanding that's important is this idea of plans. So unlike Kirchner and Schumpeter, who don't really account for failure, Lachman does. He says that actually plans themselves are subjective interpretations of the objective. Okay? I don't need to draw that out again. You guys know what a supply and demand curve looks like at this point. So I can, I can do all the planning and all the strategic group uh, uh, mapping that I want to do, and I can get some sort of an idea of what the true equilibrium looks like. Okay. However, my interpretation of the supply and demand curve will look very different from somebody else's interpretation of the supply and demand curve, very different than the hundredth person's interpretation of that supply and demand curve. Because we are subjectively interpreting something that objectively exists. Okay. And Therefore, some of us will inevitably be wrong, which further perpetuates disequilibrium. I'll give an example of the subjective versus the objective. Okay? I went with some of my students and I said, hey, I don't know if I'm allowed to show trademarks on YouTube or not. Okay, this is a name brand pen. Okay? How much do you think it costs? Okay? And the students all raised their hands. Some said 10 cents, some said 50 cents, somebody said five dollars, blah blah blah. They all had different answers, and I said, aha. See, it's a buck twenty-two. That is the objective price, at least for, for me, what I had to pay for it was a buck twenty-two. But all of my students had different interpretations of what I actually paid. Objectively, this pen was a buck twenty-two. But subjectively, the, the price uh, range was like from $0.05 cents to $5. OK? 
Okay, so we all have different interpretations of what plans are. And, and you'll find this again. You, as an entrepreneur, you go out and you start doing your feasibility analyses and all these different things. Everybody's going to give you different advice of how to progress in your business. That's why the true opportunity may be objective, may, but your ability to understand and interpret that opportunity is totally subjective. Okay, and that's where we start talking about this divergence of plans, right? And each person will have a different set of plans and they get further and further and further apart. Again, reinforcing objective versus subjective nature of plans. And there's also this revision of plans thing that the other Austrian, Austrian economics don't really talk about. Okay? And that is the idea that, okay, let's say the supply and demand curve is here at day one and we've made our wonderful plan, but bam, because of the fact we enter a market, Everybody else changes and interacts, and the supply and demand curve changes. And in order to progress, we need a new plan in order to succeed in day three, day four, day 100. Again, going back to the Mac example, as Apple got into the smartphone market, all the other competitors in the smartphone market interacted with the introduction of the, pardon me, of the iPhone. And the more Apple does something to the market, the more everybody else tries to keep up, which forces Apple to be in a continuous state of disequilibrium, a continuous state of innovation. Bam! Hopefully this is helpful. In our next video, we're going to talk about Lachman's capital theory. Hope you like this video. I'm sorry, I get, I get so pumped up and jazzed up when I start talking about this stuff. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comments. Give me a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe and looking forward to seeing the next video.